overflowing. More than 86,000 prisoners are currently incarcerated within their walls. For almost all of these prisoners, the aim is rehabilitation and release. But a tiny number are deemed so dangerous and depraved that they will never be freed. This extraordinary group of 47 men and one woman includes serial killers, torturers, hired assassins, and psychotic sadists. In some cases, the faces are familiar. Others are better known by the nicknames given to them by the press. But many of them you will never have heard of. This series will shine a light on the dark world of some of these killers. This is Arthur Hutchinson, the man guilty of a wedding day massacre. To wipe out one family is an indication of just how dangerous this man is. It didn't matter who got in his way because they would destroy them if they were in his way. A man with a disturbing past. He used to rape, rape and rape me. That was terrified. <laughs> They call some people animals, but animals are not like that. You know, I mean, no, he was inhuman. A fugitive who would become the most wanted man in Britain. It's not very often that you get an entire family, almost, uh, killed in one fell swoop. And would taunt police with a series of bizarre letters and phone calls. So I, the fox, he loved it. This is someone who'd switched off the humanity. All he thought of was what he wanted. He would take. South Yorkshire, an affluent suburb of Sheffield situated on the edge of the Peak District. Famous for its stunning views and rich in culture. But in October 1983, the tranquility of this quaint village was shattered by a crime that shook Britain. Detective Chief Inspector Mick Burdis was one of the first officers on the scene. Well, I was working in my office in, in the middle of Sheffield and received a call to say that uh, some bodies had been found in a house by a workman who had returned to remove a marquee following a, a, a wedding function that had been held at this particular house. Mick Burdis had investigated dozens of murders, but nothing could have prepared him for the horror inside this house. Scenes are, have an eerie feeling to them, so we, we, we found it very, very strange. Um, and also horrific, because uh, when we eventually we did find uh, the three bodies, they, they, they had suffered very, very severe and very savage injuries. Virtually an entire family had been wiped out. A mother, father and their son lay dead. And a teenage girl had been subjected to a vicious and prolonged rape. Police had never seen such savagery. And what made it more sickening was the attacks had happened just hours after the eldest daughter had celebrated her wedding in a marquee in the garden. A tragic twist that would make the investigation especially difficult. We had about 400 people connected with the actual wedding, with guests and with the friends and associates, and the people involved in catering and in photography and all the rest of the, the trappings that go on with weddings. So we had very, very rapidly developed a, an enormous inquiry. Now the killer had vanished. No one knew where or when he would strike next. 
There was a lot of fear in the area, a lot of fear. People were quite terrified by what had happened. He'd quite clearly been prepared to murder three people, totally unnecessarily, uh, and, and the, there was no reason to think that he wouldn't do the same again. With a killer on the loose, these horrific murders quickly became headline news. In the centre of the press pack was Yorkshire Post reporter Alan Whitehouse. I think what really hit us all between the eyes, everybody involved in the story, was the, 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 the sheer savagery, the, the, the horrificness of these killings, because it's not very often that you get an entire family, almost, uh, killed in one fell swoop, and it's not very often that anybody gets killed in quite such horrific circumstances. And uh, I think we were all uh, um, taken aback, really. This killer needed to be caught before more lives were lost. An incident room was set up in the village hall and forensic officers began scouring the area in search of clues. But their priority had to be the only surviving victim, the young girl who had survived a terrifying ordeal. She was very, very traumatised. Um, we didn't get an awful lot from her, other than that she'd been taken from her bedroom uh, down the stairs. She was actually found tied to uh, one of the poles of the marquee um, in, in a state of, of total psychological collapse, really. But she was the only eyewitness the only living person to have come face to face with this sadistic killer. Her evidence would be critical. Vic Bruff was the man tasked with talking to the girl and sketching her memories. I got a call in the evening and uh, uh, went over to Sheffield at uh, the police station there, met the victim, and uh, I started to do the drawing. She was really traumatised. Sometimes you have to switch off, you know? And I just got my head into the drawing, and uh, and, and that was it, you know? I, I, uh, I, I just did it. <laughs> Slowly, the girl began to picture the killer once more, and she recalled terrifying details of the attacks. She told police that after slaughtering three victims, the murderer had calmly drunk from a bottle of champagne and helped himself to food in the fridge. We did see some cheese with, with bite marks in. Now, that was very unusual. Most people don't bite into a cheese in the way that this was. But what kind of man can kill three people and then calmly swig on a bottle of champagne? Kerry Danes is a forensic psychologist. She studies offenders and what makes them tick. Hedonistic and entirely callous. To my mind, this is somebody with an extremely abnormal and probably highly psychopathic personality because this is somebody who is not only capable of breathtaking violence, but he literally revels in his cruelty. But could these actions trigger his downfall? As he calmly moved through the house, he was leaving behind vital clues. Officers found a fingerprint on the champagne bottle and they also thought they had found the killer's blood, suggesting he might have injured his leg. When we examined uh, the bedroom, we discovered that some of the furniture had been moved, um, but in particular, on the bed were some patches of blood that had been imprinted onto the sheet, and that was quite a significant finding. But even though detectives had the killer's fingerprint and blood type, they were no closer to identifying him. Computerized databases didn't exist in the 1980s. Finding a match 
would take time. But then came a phone call, and this would change everything. Well, I had a call from a colleague who rang me to say that um, uh, they had been dealing with a man uh, for a, an offence of rape in the Selby area, and that there might be a similarity between that crime and, and the crime that we were investigating. And he had escaped whilst attending court um, and, and was on the run. Detectives were told the fugitive was a man called Arthur Hutchinson and were given details of his criminal past. Details that put the whole team on red alert. It indicated to us exactly the sort of person that we were dealing with. And of course it made the search for him even more important because he was such a dangerous man. A ruthless and dangerous killer was at large. Could he be stopped before he killed again? In South Yorkshire, the hunt was on for a brutal killer, a man who had butchered a family of three and raped a young girl at knife point. A man who appeared to have no guilt or emotion, swigging champagne in the midst of the bloodbath. But this was a mistake. Forensic officers had found his fingerprint on a bottle and now a detective from North Yorkshire had arrived, claiming he knew who the killer was. He was a criminal called Arthur Hutchinson, who had recently escaped their custody. Crucially, the visiting officer had his prints. He brought with him their sets of fingerprints that they'd taken at the time of his arrest. Um, we, at the same time, were, were undertaking our own fingerprint examination, particularly on the champagne bottle in the kitchen. Uh, and we discovered a fingerprint on there that matched the fingerprint uh, that, that they brought with us. The print on the champagne bottle placed Hutchinson at the scene. But was he the murderer and the man who had subjected a young girl to a terrifying rape? The artist's impression would be critical. She said he... he got cur the curlyish air, curly air. A little bit of stubble on, 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 uh, on his face. She did say his nose was slightly uh, bent, uh, Roman, maybe br had been broken at some time, I don't know. Uh, as she was describing the eyes, I had to make one or two alterations because it's the eyes that really make the person look as they are. But, uh, it was quite detailed. The actual information she gave me was, was very good. After several hours, the drawing was complete. It was compared to the custody photo brought to the incident room. The similarity was remarkable. We expected them to look similar. We were amazed at how close the, the resemblance was. Her, her drawing really was as accurate of a, a picture of Hutchinson as you would have got. So we knew then that we were looking for Arthur Hutchinson. But detectives still had no idea where Hutchinson had gone, and this was a man who was used to hiding from the police. We'd now got a man who'd been on the run for a few weeks. We'd no idea where his, his connections were and his locations were, and where he was hiding. So it brought with, with us great relief in terms of identifying the person, but it also brought problems in trying to identify where he was and, and what he'd been doing in the meantime. Detectives needed to understand more about their killer. Who was Arthur Hutchinson and what had triggered such a brutal crime? The answers lay over a hundred miles away on a housing estate in Hartlepool. Well, this is the edge of the Out Manor estate, Hartlepool. This is the area in which uh, Arthur Hutchinson was brought up. His mother's house is beyond those far trees. Detective Chief Inspector Dick Copeman worked with Cleveland Police for 20 years. Arthur Hutchinson was a name he knew well. Around about 17-year-old, um, he started committing petty crime. 
theft of uh, motor vehicles, uh, changing the license plates on vehicles, just a bit of a jack the lad, uh, nothing to make him uh, stand out from uh, a lot of other petty criminals. But in his early teens, Hutchinson began working as a farmhand and fellow workers saw a disturbing side to his personality. There was an undercurrent all the time and you could tell he wasn't, he wasn't genuine. That's what I would say. Even more worrying was how Hutchinson would be seen hanging around the village, armed with a large stick. About five foot long, about two inches thick at the butt end and tapering up, and he used to hold it like that. And it wasn't a walking stick. There was no possible way why he should carry such a thing. I've never seen anyone else carrying such a thing, and that told the story that inwardly he was violent. Hutchinson would also lust after young girls in the area, and when George told him to stop, he showed his true colours. He wasn't a nice person to speak to, but of course I spoke to him one day when I was annoying him. I, I didn't want to provoke him, because I could see he could be nasty. He said he could kill me with one blow. In his teenage years, Hutchinson was convicted of a number of burglaries and vehicle thefts. But there were two sides to Hutchinson. In his mother's eyes, he could do no wrong and was able to charm other women too. He had the reputation of being a ladies' man. Um, like, like the girls, uh, was, all, was classed as a bit of a charmer. One person who witnessed this side to Hutchinson was his half-brother, Dino Reardon. I can only say what, what I saw, and the women seemed to come to his allotment, and I don't know what it was, but he had a lot of women who were killing up, and that is true. You see, so he must have had something, what, you know, and I don't know what it is. Hutchinson had numerous relationships, but in 1968, he settled down and married a local woman. And it was during this marriage that the dark, dangerous side of Arthur Hutchinson came to the fore. and the, uh, the more violent temper side. The marriage lasted just three years, but Hutchinson continued to get in trouble. He amassed a number of convictions for sexual assault, theft, and possession of weapons. In 1983, he was behind bars, charged with a brutal rape. But he would never be tried for this offence. In 
In September, he arrived at Selby Magistrates Court with just one thing on his mind. I was given to believe that he asked to go to the toilet. Um, he was allowed to go to the toilet. And then uh, jumped out of a toilet window, subsequently injuring a knee, uh, but then made his escape. Hutchinson was on the run. And on October the 23rd, three weeks after he escaped, he arrived 50 miles south in the village of Dor. We've never really understood why Hutchinson went there of all the places he could have done. He had no reason to go there, and it may be that he just stumbled in. And of course, the second piece of incredible bad luck for the family was the fact that they'd had the wedding celebrations that weekend. They had the marquee tacked onto the side of the house. Uh, that gave Hutchinson the cover he needed to force a way into the house. And of course, when he was inside, uh, he was inside and, and could roam at will. It became obvious as we were assessing the scene itself that the attacker had focused on the girl uh, and had decided to, to kill in order to make sure that his activities with the girl weren't interrupted. Hearing the commotion, the bride's father came upstairs and found himself face to face with the killer. We discovered the body having fallen down the stairs, having been stabbed, uh, and then the, the, the body of his wife at the side of the bed. She'd put up quite a fight, uh, so there was some resistance uh, offered, uh, but it, I'm afraid it was, was to no good. The attacks were really, really savage attacks. The, the depth of the wounds indicated there'd been a lot of force, a lot of brutality involved in... in He injured fleeing from court. The activity that he undertook in the bedroom, where he was kneeling on the bed, that caused the injury to, to break open and the blood to flow through the bandage. And the impression on the bed was of, of a bandaged knee through which blood had seeped. And you could actually see the, the, uh, the crisscross of the bandage material. All the pieces of the jigsaw were falling into place. Two forces were now joined in the hunt for a dangerous fugitive. Our view of Arthur Hutchinson changed overnight from being a petty criminal. He was now a sadistic murderer. A man who has no thought for the feelings or the effects that his actions have on anybody. It didn't matter who got in his way because they would destroy them if they were in his way. The police had to warn the public that a killer was at large. Drastic action was needed. They decided to take the unusual step of releasing his picture. It was almost like the Wild West. You had the police issuing a photograph of Hutchinson and naming him and stressing how dangerous he was and that he shouldn't be approached. Suddenly, he, he was catapulted from being a small-time petty crook to being the most wanted man in England. But what detectives didn't know was that Hutchinson would love this publicity. The case was about to take a bizarre and sinister twist. In October 1983, a huge manhunt was underway. Detectives had released a photo of a suspected murderer, Arthur Hutchinson a man who had killed three people and raped a young girl. 
As news spread that a sadistic killer was at large, so did the panic. The, the fear spread like a ripple. Um, first of all, Dor and Totley in, in, in Sheffield, and gradually, uh, as it dawned on people, that Hutchinson was long gone, and nobody knew where he was. That's the key thing. You saw women afraid to go out by themselves, um, changing their routines, changing their habits, having boyfriends and husbands pick them up from work, exactly as happened during the hunt for Peter Sutley. Detectives in South Yorkshire believed Hutchinson had fled the area. Now every force in England was on the lookout for a dangerous murderer. None more so than DCI Dick Copeman in Hartlepool, the officer who had dealt with him two decades earlier. We were, to be honest, quite surprised that he'd committed such a heinous crime. But obviously when we were informed, we then set up a full surveillance operation. DCI Copeman and his team were on red alert. In case this Hartlepool lad came home, to the housing estate where he grew up. We have the fields behind us, in which I'm sure he played as a small boy. Like any other boys of his age, I've no doubt that they would be building lairs and dens in the wooded area behind us. But he knew the fields and the farmland like the back of his hand. Hutchinson had gone to ground and detectives were beginning to realise that this fugitive was not going to be easy to find. He always had this thing about survival training, hiding himself out in the countryside. So that's the type of character that we knew he was. One of the areas that we'd asked the public to look out for were places that might have been used as a den or as, as, as a hideout. Um, and we did get quite a number of sightings of, of, of caches of food and, uh, and, and other uh, indications that someone had probably been sleeping rough. Despite hundreds of sightings, detectives were no closer to catching their quarry. But then came a development that changed everything. I was in the newsroom, I'd been working on the story, and then this letter just arrived, and I read the letter with something approaching disbelief. Hutchinson had written to the news desk that was reporting his story. Here you are, in direct contact with the most wanted man in England at the time. So very exciting from a journalism, from a professional point of view, but also unsettling, because you could see here that there was a, a complicated and indeed a, a troubled mind at work behind all this. He warned them to stop writing about the hunt and even denied the murders. But most startling of all, the killer had given himself a nickname. Hutchinson, the fugitive who was running free, hiding in lairs and dens, had called himself the Fox. This nickname that he gave himself, the Fox, I, the Fox, begins the letter. This is clearly important to him, this, this aura, this identity that he's building uh, around himself criminals on the run, you know, like the Yorkshire Ripper. Peter Sutcliffe never named himself the Yorkshire Ripper. It's a name he didn't like. For someone to give themselves a nickname, that, that's just so unusual. That, that, that immediately gave this, this letter a, um, a, a real significance. You know, you, you felt you were dealing here with, with somebody who perhaps wasn't entirely in touch with the real world. It seemed the killer wanted to write his own front-page story. He also wanted people to know how he was evading capture. He was living rough, um, sleeping in outbuildings, uh, committing petty crimes to sustain himself. Sleeping by day, travelling by night, uh, stealing vegetables from gardens to survive. And, and this really was all part of the, the Arthur Hutchinson persona that he was trying to weave around himself. The letter gave detectives crucial clues as to how their fugitive was surviving. But what about the writing itself? 
what could be learned from how it was written. As well as alerting the police, the news desk sent a copy to behavioral psychologist, Diane Simpson. When the writing sample actually arrived, I was really worried because it was going to be quite an alarming assessment. Diane has examined the handwriting of many of our country's most dangerous killers, but this one had especially chilling undertones. We start by looking at legibility, presentation. Now, it's not aesthetically pleasing, but it's legible. He wasn't risking being misunderstood. Everything that should have been in there is in there. Next, the pressure. Pressure in handwriting is like emphasis in speech. In this case, he was pressing hard. Yes, he enjoyed, he wanted to write this. It's heavy all the way through, particularly at the beginning. I, the fox, he loved it. Think of body language. Someone who swaggers this writing, swaggers over the page. Arthur chooses himself to be known as the fox and the press play along with that. That gives us quite an insight into his sense of identity, but also his need to be acknowledged and to control the situation. He wants to be seen as cunning, quick-witted and resourceful. He's playing out a fantasy. It's almost like an SAS-style survival story, and he wants to manipulate the way in which that story ends. The phone call was made to a newspaper, and because of some of the detailed information in the call, detectives are convinced that it's genuine. He's on the run from the police. He's arguably the most wanted man in Britain at the time, and he chooses to call the Yorkshire Post. I'm not just writing to you anymore, picking the phone upon you and saying, it's the fox. Police were becoming increasingly anxious about the kind of man they were dealing with, a man who seemed to love being headline news and to enjoy the thrill of the chase. He was backward, you say, and everybody used to take the mickey out of him and he was trying to prove something all the time. I think this is partly the key to the, 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 the whole Hutchinson enigma. Uh, he was a, an insignificant man who felt he'd not had the chances in life that perhaps he should have had. And this was a way of drawing attention to himself. And I, I think this is a thread that, that, that runs right the way through the whole Hutchinson investigation, that he was seeking attention, he was trying to draw attention to himself, and when he got it, he reveled in it. Every day, Police were building a clearer picture of the fox, and it was becoming more and more chilling. They had his handwriting, they knew what he looked like, and now they even knew what he sounded like. But they were still no closer to catching him, and the fox knew it. He was taunting the police 
He thought he was cleverer than um, the law enforcement officers. And I think the fact that he had escaped from police custody in Selby um, sort of boosted his image that he was untouchable. But detectives had a plan, a plan that would manipulate Hutchinson's ego. The officers knew Hutchinson had cut his leg during his escape from court after finding his blood at the murder scene. Could this injury be his Achilles heel? During one of the broadcasts we gave to the media, we'd indicated that this injury to his leg may well be tingling, it may well be causing him trouble, and it could well become gangrenous, and, and he could lose the limb and probably die. They hoped this would make the fox doubt his own invincibility, and like a wounded animal, he would be driven back to the place he felt safe, the fields where he played as a child, and to the mother he loved. I think he was very close. His mother, Louise, always said that he was her favorite son. He did seem to gravitate back towards his mother's whenever he was in trouble. Officers would use his mother as bait. They hoped he would be desperate to see her one last time. And it seemed their plan was working. Officers tapped his mother's phone and Hutchinson called home. It was about four o'clock in the morning uh, when we received the intelligence that he was indeed coming back to make his peace with his mother one last time. The trap was set. 400 officers lay in wait. Now they just needed the fox to take the bait. November 1983, police forces across the north of England were looking for a murderer. A man who had killed three members of the same family and subjected a teenage girl to a terrifying rape. A man who called himself the Fox and was running free, hiding in lairs. But the Fox didn't know that the trap was set. Well, this is the very edge of the uh, Outer Manor Council estate where Louise Arthur Hutchinson's mother lived. Arthur Hutchinson, as a boy, would know this area very, very well indeed, and he felt at home in this area. Detectives knew Hutchinson was on his way back home to see his mum, and they were lying in wait. To get to his mother's, Arthur would have to come through the field area here. There's so many um, abandoned farm buildings, wooded areas where anyone could hide with ease. Hundreds of police officers and dogs flooded the area, ready to catch the fox. The net was tightening, and on the 5th of November it was finally time for detectives to flush out their quarry. It was a, a, a cold, misty November day. Uh, it was, we knew it was going to get dark quite early. Um, so we concentrated our efforts on the afternoon, uh, checking out all the farm buildings, the outbuildings, the wooded areas. George Bales was one of the farmers whose buildings were checked and he came dangerously close to being face to face with the murderer. Spoke to the wife and I said, uh, you know, I think I'll go and feed the dogs and check the field with cattle that's inside. And uh, when I went back and the housewife tells me, he says, did you see him? He says, see you? He says, well, Hutchinson. Just as officers suspected, Hutchinson had been hiding in the barns and now he was making a run for it. We went way down the bottom field, uh, along the bottom, up the track, and then diagonally across what we call the moors, on the hilltop there, and heading towards uh, Alton Manor. Hutchinson was heading straight to his mother's house, and straight into the trap. 
in an area way beyond the trees that you can see on the horizon uh, was a copse of trees and the dog section flushed Arthur out of those trees but Hutchinson wasn't going down without a fight he pulled out a large knife and made one final run. He ran over two or three fields, and it was then that the, the net of police officers closed in on him. Eventually, the dog section, in fact, brought him down and arrested him. I knew that he would go back and see his mother like, because he had nowhere else to go. He was a mummy's boy, say. But this dangerous fugitive had one final surprise in store, which showed the lengths he'd gone to to avoid capture. He was taken to Stockton Police Office under arrest. His mother, Louise, had requested that she was able to see him. She exclaimed that she didn't even recognize him as being a son. He changed his appearance so much. This is a picture of Hutchinson just before he escaped. And this is the picture of, of Hutchinson on the 7th of November when we'd arrested him. I don't think I would have expected the public to be able to identify him from the pictures we'd circulated. On the 14th of September 1984, Hutchinson was found guilty of the murder of three people and the rape of a teenage girl. Crimes that were both terrifying and brutal. And crimes that earned him a place on the short list of prisoners who will never be released. Many of the other criminals that I've dealt with uh, have had feelings of remorse uh, and have regretted to a large extent the active actions that they've committed. Not all of them, but, but certainly most of them have. Arthur Hutchinson didn't have that, those, those sort of feelings. I think what he did was, uh, I don't know, it's terrible. They call some people animals, but animals are not like that. You know, I mean, brand new When Life Means Life is back same time next Monday. And this Sunday at nine, we have the start of another brand new series, Crimes That Shook Britain with the manhunt for gunman Raoul Moat.